Yeah. Matt Lucas, welcome to Unfiltered. It's a, real, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Actually. Thank you very much. It's very nice to uh, be here with you. We've met before, but I, have you interviewed me before? I have never interviewed you before. Really? We, had, we had a lunch in quite strange circumstances, accompanied by the legend that is Curtis Stigers. Curtis one of those, Stigers, That's yeah. the showbiz dream, isn't yeah. it? And oddly. And Nick Revel. And Nick Revel, the brilliant comedian. When, yeah. when, and, and we got on quite well, I hope. I, hope, I, I hope feel we, we did. Yeah, I, good. I because feel. you were writing this when oh, yeah. we met That's and, right. and you were quite um you probably don't remember but you were quite immersed i think it, it felt almost as if you were poking your head outside the sort of porthole of a submarine for the first time in a while and and it was clear that you were you'd come up with the idea of doing the the, the memoir as an a to z R remind me why that was um i suppose just because uh i thought probably people won't be very interested in you know the details of my birth and so I thought well this way it'll give me a chance an A to Z so so uh, uh, and it's and it's not strictly chronological although no. there is a kind of loose chronology to it but um, you know B is for baldness G is for gay I just thought I just thought oh this allows me to sort of get to the point this way you know um, and also to avoid the slight grandiosity of writing an autobiography at such a young age you can kind of <laughs> you can kind of pretend it isn't it's funny i don't think of myself as young anymore um well it's weird uh actually i think a lot of comedians write their autobiographies in their 30s now yes, this is true and um i think i just about had enough to fill up a book and there was a lot of stuff that could have filled up a second book that i decided not to write why because i think you can't um you can't write everything uh, you've got to keep some stuff for yourself. And also, the, the truth, as I as I found out uh, uh, in releasing this book, is that anything you write is under scrutiny. And um, there's some things that, that you can't really talk about because they affect other people, maybe. Um, so, you know, I write that my parents got divorced, but I don't write the strict details, you know, of, of the divorce. Their story, well, yeah. it's their business, yeah, it's not mine. I mean, it's part of my life, but it's it's, you know... Then you know my family aren't really in the business. You Are you know? comfortable talking about yourself? Did you did you find writing about yourself fun? Um, well, it was weird because obviously uh, it forced me to think about uh, aspects of my life in maybe things I hadn't thought about for a while. So I found it um, in some ways quite hard. Actually, actually, you know what? I think I've, I think what is quite hard to talk about is your career because you know one can. You can write about your life and, you know, uh, things that have happened to you, events that have happened to you with a sense of ownership. But once you start talking about your career, you are, you know, your words do impact on other people that you worked with who are still out there working. And um, so, you know, you're not, there you're is... Not, a you're not selling it. You realise that. You're, say, you're saying there's no juicy stories about people that I've collaborated with and there's not a lot of personal stuff in it either. That which, neither of which are true. I mean, there's, there's yeah, no. but I think I think I think there is. I th all right, this is so. This is what's happened, right? So, uh, so I'll give you I'll give you an example. So, um, uh, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you yes. don't, right? So, if you, if you write a book about yourself, so for instance, I just spent a year on Doctor Who, and I had a great experience, and I got along with everyone, and it, it was just it was supposed to be one episode, and it ended up being many, many, many more than that. Um, a whole series, and largely because um, the character was so successful. Yeah, well, yeah. People seem to to you know the character the character grew and developed thanks to the writing and and uh, and there was a, a good chemistry on screen with the other hmm. with the other actors and so yeah and so I was there right and there are uh, people on the show that over here they call runners in America they be called PAs and um, uh, 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 Lauren and uh, Rian and Chris, and their job was to just, often to just to knock on my trailer door and say, uh, can I get you anything? And I would say, uh, oh, can I have uh, 11 peanuts and a bottle of Dettol, please? Or can I have uh, one of those lawn mowers you can sit on? <laughs> so I'd say something silly and they would laugh, right? And that would, that would be that. And then very occasionally they'd say, can I get you something? And I'd say, yes, can I have a can of Coke or a yeah. glass of water, you know, I was, I was relatively, I think you would say I was relatively low maintenance. <laughs> and, um, but the Daily Mail in their, in, their, in their review of the book wrote a thing about how I'm kind of hated by the crew because I send them off to get, I think it's funny to send them off to get these 
pointless things which just for my own amusement and that I'm so that they kind of hate me and I thought well no I'm clear I'm clearly joking. And no, no, I've told the story, not, not, the, not the runners yeah, yeah, exactly, secretly. Exactly, I'm clearly joking. I'm still friends with all those people. We still message each other. Like, I still, like, no, there was no, this was done for, we were just mucking about. Like, there was, there's clearly, and it's very, and it's very clear in the book that yes. I was just, like, just being silly, you know. And, uh, but they wrote a story about how, you know, how, how I was hated on the set and things like that. So I think, I think anything you write will be willfully misinterpreted when you write a book. So you have to just be really, really aware. Um, for instance, there is not a bad word about David Williams in this book. There's not a bad word about David Williams. Um, I have no reason to say a bad word about him. Um, but they still ran a story saying the Battle of Little Britain. Mm. And they wrote, I made a, I think I make a joke in the book about, um, I make some kind of, joke about how he's so, now sold so many children's books that I'm talking about flying in the book and about that he can have his own private jet with a river a pink private jet with a river to swim up and down it but it's like it's clearly a gag yes. but again the Daily Mail wrote something like oh uh, he's seething with jealousy he's fueled with jealousy it's like no I'm happy for my friend like it's done really well and like and they wrote a thing about uh, you know because uh, David got an OBE and like supposedly I was, you know, snubbed or bitter or whatever. And it's like, well, no, I, no, I publicly congratulated him when it was, when the news came out. I congratulated him again publicly when, uh, when he received it. I also wrote to him privately because, of course, and that, you know, we had a, a cordial interchange. Mm -hmm. So like, and so, and so it's a strange thing. So even when you write something positive, you're not, you know, you're in control of the book, but you're not really in control of um, reaction. Of, of reaction, and you just have to accept that. Why? And but it does. I do think. I do think. In some ways, there would be things you could talk about that you just basically you have to not talk about them. Not because um, they're not true, but I think some people choose. You know, for, we're, we live in the clickbait age, and so context is not really. It's not really like. Sure. It, it, given often, you know, because actually, even if you have warm feelings for someone, they'll write that you don't, you know, and it's and it's strange. And I was sad for David when that story came out because I thought he's getting an OBE today and that's his day. And yet they've tried to make a story about something else. And I just thought, and he must, you know, it's just like, did, well, that's his day. Did you send him a message or anything like that? Did no, because he knows. Well, I, I wrote to him to say congratulations. Right. But I mean, the, no, because he knows. He sure. knows. He's, he's been doing it But it's still it as as cast a shadow potentially over Well, not massively, no. Not a massive shadow. But it's just an example of the fact that when you write a book, you have to be aware. Like, for instance, I do Q&As to promote the book. And I'm just very, very aware that there are journalists in the audience at the Q&As. So any joke you make will be pounced on. So... These days, being a comedian, you are like a politician. Yes. You have to watch absolutely everything you say. You, you, Even this conversation may be reported with me as, as me kind of whinging. Well, I'm not really whinging. I'm just kind of contextualizing the experience of writing the book. The, the reality is the book is actually very candid, yes, I think. Is. But it is easier to write about your life than your career, I found, which I always thought would be the other way around. Yes. Because um, if I was to say... Uh, I thought this show I did wasn't as good as that show I did or something. It would be reported as me, I'm slamming something. And because and because such hyperbole exists, you know, in, mm. in, in the way things are reported, even in the broadsheets, it just makes you have to be, it, it brings about a kind of blandness. And, but, but, but the book itself, the book itself, <laughs> I think is very candid and very revealing. Um, and, uh, well, it is. And, and, I feel and, it is. You and know. yet, I, I, you know, I was going to ask you, as you were describing that, and as, as we'll come on, that's far from the worst treatment you've received from the Daily Mail over the years. I was going to ask you why you let it get to you. But, of course, that presumes that there's a choice involved. What, what, what are you talking about specifically? So just, just uh, it's, it, my dad was a newspaper journalist, I was a newspaper journalist, and the old phrase about it being tomorrow's fish and chip paper... It, it, it's a cliche because it has a certain resonance. And but I don't think that's it. true anymore because I think things, I think, no, I don't think because of, because of online, if something happens. But if you know kind of, yeah. the truth and the people about whom you're 
talking know the truth and the embellishment and the exaggeration is only really being done by the journalists. It's, it's not a criticism, it's a question, but you could be a no. bit more relaxed about it, uh, perhaps. It depends. Yeah. Um, I think there was, there was a situation recently where there's a line in my book where I explain why I'm not going to go into detail about my relationship with my late partner. Uh, and I explain, you know, if you read the book, you understand why. Absolutely. I do talk, I do talk yes. about bereavement in the book, but I don't talk about a great deal about him, about our relationship, because I feel that there's a, a, an immorality in using his suffering to, to sell my book. I just think it's, I'm not comfortable with it. Mm. And I've never done, I've never have done that. Um, I went to an awards ceremony uh, to pick up an award, the Attitude Awards. And um, I, I said a few words from the stage just to thank them for the award and made a couple of gags. Um, and the Metro newspaper uh, took some lines, they, they, they reported it as uh, Matt's uh, award, you know, receives an award tinged with sadness mm. because um, uh, because his late partner wasn't alive. And what they did was they took some, they took some lines from the book and said, you know, and, and made out like I'd said those words about Kevin at the ceremony, and which the ceremony was nothing to do with. I see. With any of that. Yes. It was nothing to do with the book. It was nothing to do with anything. I was just receiving a comedian award, and um, uh, and I was offended by that because it looked like. I was using a moment on the red carpet to talk about my late partner to try and gain sympathy and kind of endorsement from the public to say, feel sorry for me and, you know, appreciate my journey that I've come through this and now I'm receiving an award and it's not, but it just didn't happen. None of that actually happened. I would not stand on a red carpet and say, oh yeah, I wish he was here. I, Cause I don't, yeah. I've never given, I don't give interviews about him at all. So I was, I, was, I was upset by that because I think it looked like I was using his suffering to kind of uh, seem more appealing and more deserving of success. And I haven't done that. And the book doesn't do that either. No, it doesn't. The book acknowledges that we had a relationship and it talks about bereavement because it's something I live with and it's something people and many, 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 many people live with and work through. Uh, in their lives and I thought it would not be honest to not talk about that because it's been a, a, a big you know a big big part of my life for the past few years but I would not be so cheap and so crass as to give an interview where I talk about it and that offended me uh, uh, on his behalf and because the impression given was that you had well, it's a it. false impression so it's a false impression there's a line in the book where I explain why I won't talk about him and they took that line and put it as if I'd given it as an interview and I hadn't um and, they, and 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 it and it went uncorrected. Of course. It's, it remains uncorrected. It, 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 and the yeah. truth is halfway. The lie yeah. is halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots. Yeah. On. Now Do I realise. I realise in the grand scheme of things, most people would read it and not even notice it. No, but it's you. you let me use. Yeah. I'm just going to run a phrase by you, which just popped into my head while you were talking. You sound. You speak like a man who, who worries that you lose custody of your own character when the newspapers get hold of. These Where's sort that? Of, what you've. That's just popped into yeah. my head now. Listening to you, you're, One, you're almost describing. I am me. Mm. I make I think deeply uh, more deeply than perhaps people appreciate for someone who's achieved fame by being silly. You're, you're a very deep thinker, and you think deeply well, about about yourself and your relationship with people and with the world. And then these lazy journalists, of which I used to be one. I have to be honest. I was a tabloid journalist who forgot that famous people were human beings and molded quotes to just get a bigger impact for the story. I wouldn't have done the stuff that you've just described. Everyone has certain standards, but you then have a portrayal in public that you don't recognise as being you. And, and actually, although you're worried about sounding as if you're whinging, that's, a, that's, that's an incredibly bad thing to happen to someone. Yeah, well, the, the thing I'll say is there's a difference, right? So yeah. the story I'm describing in the Daily Mail where they, um, uh, where they said... Well, they deliberately misunderstand something to make yeah, you look like a bit of a bastard. Yeah, I didn't really care about that because sure. I knew the truth. So that did not haunt me. Yes. That did not keep me up at night. I was just like, oh, well, yeah. And... and Anyone who reads the book would know that I was just joking. And yes. even some people who read the article would probably... Most people are going to... Th I'm sure he didn't send someone out for 11 Smarties and a bottle of bleach. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like, it's clearly <laughs> like... You know, but whatever, whatever. Um, 
uh, Kevin, Kevin's legacy. Yeah, is I different. think I think that's I think that is a, it's a completely different thing. Yeah, mm. that's completely different. And I understand. It's, and that. it's I think it is a line that sh- you know shouldn't as a, as a, if you're if you're a decent human you wouldn't cross that line with somebody you'd respect unless you'd you've respect. forgotten that 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 people like you are humans and that that's something common to modern fame isn't it is that that, that it, there's an ubiquity to it and uh, especially when when Little Britain was in its heyday you would have had one of the most recognizable faces in the country and that hmm. brings with it a sense of ownership these people think they own you and the tabloids are sort of feeding that and gating. in some ways they do you know and I respect that which is why you know why I'm not going to sue over somebody yeah. saying that I do you know what I mean yes, Sent- I do. Yeah, you're like you have to choose your battles you know and but I just think there are certain lines you don't cross and um you know it's 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 uh it's it's um but it's it's it is part of the job it's what happens you know are there any bits about being famous that you currently enjoy <laughs> yeah i'm sure i do i go got on, to go, go to on. lunch with you <laughs> and i would have done that anyway and nick revel <laughs> um yeah it's 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 a weird thing so i live i live most of the year in in california where some people sort of know who i am mm. you're like oh you're that bridesmaids dude or something like that and because I was in that film for a few minutes, and <laughs> and some people know because of Doctor Who has a, has a kind of audience, and and actually Little Britain was quite big there, but it's a different it's a different type of fame. It's like oh yeah, you're that guy, mm. and I'm rarely the most famous person in the room because even if you go to a diner, there's a chance a big star will be in the corner yes. just because it's where lots of people live uh, who are in film and TV so, and music. So. So you prefer the, that to London, then? Well, the the reality of my life is that I go about pretty much just living a quite a. a I want to say it's odd because you go. Well, I moved to LA for normality, which is something that people, <laughs> pe- most people would say, well, that's not. But actually, I live a relatively hermetic existence, and I write, and I have uh, two dogs, and um, uh, through choice, I, is it? Entirely... I haven't done recently. Um, Are you quite well, it was it was after after um, you know I had that bereavement. I just yes. I just I, I knew that I needed to 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 have something else in my life. So so something new and something different. Uh, so it just it made sense to me to go somewhere warm and somewhere private and peaceful, and it works really well for me. Yeah, it's just my it's just what I, you know I I pulled back and that is you know some people some people like to be out every night and those things and I'm I'm, I'm happy not being but when I'm in London uh, you know because I still I'm still a British citizen and when I'm here then I'm a much more sociable being and my friend a lot you know my old friends are here my mm. family are here I tend to do a lot of filming here I'll often write there and film here so for me the combination of the two is what works for me. I would, I couldn't just be live in the middle of nowhere, all the time, but I, but I, I, I wouldn't want to just be in London all the time. Do you get lonely? Uh, I'm very lucky. I have the best friends. I have lovely friends that I've known for years, close friends that I was at school with, that I was at college with. My family live nearby. Um, so, no, 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 not, not really, no. You, do you? Uh, do I? No, I've got two kids and a wife. Right? Exactly, you've got I, too I, much I going on. I dream of the solitariness that you enjoy in well, Los Angeles. Exactly. I look so forward I, to long-haul flights so yeah. I can have a bit of a rest. Right, well, I get, I get, you know, I don't really get lonely because I've got, I've got five or six really great friends in mm. LA, most of whom are British, friends that I've known, some of, uh, you know, my friend Reese, uh, Reese and Lucy, I've known Reese for... 25 years but he moved out to the US a few years after me so it's like we have a history but we're also both over there and I've got other friends like that um you know uh, there was another guy two two people who who both work in the industry that I was at school with who both live out there that I see a lot brilliant yeah um have you talked about fame I I did the 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 early days of your career I was surprised by how you're not going to like this word but but it was a relatively effortless Rise, Bob Mortimer seeing you, uh, arranging for other people to see you, and then shooting stars. That, well, what I couldn't pick up is whether or not you ever wanted to be famous, or as opposed to just wanting to make a living doing, having discovered how much you enjoyed making people laugh. They're two quite different things, and yet in your line of work, you can't really achieve one without having to be the other. Uh, not so much in front of the camera, no. Um... It, I think it's just ch- it's been different at different parts of my life. So right. when I was, as I talk about in the book, when I was six, 
my hair fell out. And so I got a lot of attention for that. Mm. I was the kid in the town with no hair. Um, and other kids would always point it out, you know, and and because kids say what they're thinking, don't they? They just say it. Mm. So they just go, you got no hair. Or they laugh at you or they patronize you or they, you know, I was very objectified as a child. And so, and so I, I really, I accepted that I had attention, but I really wanted it to be for something other than just how I looked. I thought, well, this is, even at a young age, I thought, well, what's this? This is just weird. This is stupid. Like, <laughs> what? Just because I've got no hair. Um, that couldn't be my character. That doesn't make sense. Uh, didn't make sense to me. So that kind of drove me on to sort of utilize this attention and make something more positive from it. So I think if you'd asked me when I was 12, 13, 14, I'd say, yeah, I want to be famous. But after that, I think, it, no, I think it was, I want to be creative and I want the validation and the validation in your mind comes through fame, you know. Um, but oddly enough, I was doing the comedy circuit from the age of 18 and-, and uh, What and was I, that like? I mean, that was pretty it was, brutal. It was brutal, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I chose to do it yes. and it was brutal, but I mean, it was highs and lows. It was the lowest lows and the biggest highs. You did highs. open spots. I did open spots. So you turn up literally unknown, unheralded, yeah. and try out material on a room you knew nothing about. That's right. And, and also I did a strange, very strange act. Um, Tell me, what because was it? I, well, I wasn't, I didn't feel confident just being me, because there's a kind of honesty to being a stand-up. You know, it was the idea of you'd stand there with a cigarette in one hand and a pint in the other and wearing a T-shirt and you'd talk about yourself, about your relationships, about your political views. You'd, you'd, you know, the idea was it was kind of unfiltered and authentic. Um, and I just, at 18, I wasn't out yet to my friends and family. And um, I, 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 you know, I was just full of angst. Sure. I was a teenager. Yes. And but that makes it an even odder thing to do. To, yeah. To so, so yeah. So what I did was I played this character called Sir Bernard Chumley, who was this, uh, you know, old actor. And and because I'd done a lot of youth theatre as a kid, I'd been in a West End play at the age of fourteen, and uh, done national youth music theatre, national youth theatre, all these kind of voluntary things that you audition for um, as a kid, and and. So I kind of knew that those kind of fruity older types that used to kind of hang around <laughs> young actors uh, like me. And so <laughs> and so I, I just felt comfortable in, in that skin. And um, I don't know that I was particularly funny, but I was different. Yes. And that seemed to be enough to kind of propel me. But the interesting thing was that uh, by the age of 21, I did uh, I was doing shooting stars, you know, uh, with Vic and Bob. And then, and then, although that was obviously a bit of a life changer for me, it did kill my stand-up because audiences would see me and expect to see me dressed as a baby and doing a, a George Dawes routine, which I didn't really have, you know, because George Dawes... So they were the tiny little vignettes for people not familiar yeah. with shooting stars. Yeah. There it, it, it was not a 45-minute act. There. No, it wasn't a character. It was more like a persona. It was yes. like, look, I just dress like this and I just say anything. <laughs> And the stand-up act was a little bit more textured and as it would be because you're, yeah, you're on stage for half an hour or whatever, yes. 20 minutes. And so, uh, and so actually what happened was then even, even venues would bill me as George Dawes or, right. or Because compares. they're trying to sell tickets and yeah, you're recognisable yeah, yeah, by yeah, now. It's... Exactly. And so, and then I'd walk on as this other character and people would be yelling, what are the scores George Dawes while I was doing this other thing? And I, yeah. I didn't really know what to do <laughs> with that. Slightly so slightly irritating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I, and, and it just, it just became a harder thing to do. And I, and I didn't really have a George Dawes act that I felt I could do or, and I, or, or particularly want to outside of that show. Like, I love doing it in the show. But so just how did that there. happen, Matt? How did you go? Um, and most of the questions I, I ask you today are answered in the book. But obviously, oh, right. we're here to do, we're here to do, to, to walk the tightrope between the two, the sure. stuff that's on the page and that, that isn't. Just tell us how you moved from, what, what, what did Bob Mortimer see that, that, that brought George Dawes to life when you were essentially uh, portraying a, a, a sort of thespian roué from, from the pages of Central Casting? Um... Well, you'd have to ask him. He told me at the time that uh, I was the angriest man he'd ever seen. Um, were you? Uh, oh, no, well, you don't know how many I, people he's I, seen, but yeah, were you, were I was you angry, very angry? Yeah, I was angry. I was angry. I was, t I was 18. 18 year olds are angry. Not all of them, you know. Well, I was. A lot of them are high. I'd, yeah, well, I, I, uh, no, I was angry because I'd, I don't know, I'd, I felt like, uh, you know, like I had, life hadn't given me a fair 
crack of the whip, you know, I felt, oh, I lost my hair when I was six and my parents had divorced and my dad had been in prison. And mm. I just, I just thought like, what's, you know, what's this? What's and and this? you were very And hard. I was overweight and pale. You wouldn't know it's think. No, absolutely, what a transformation. And, yeah, must be hot. And Los know, Angeles. Yeah, that's it. look what LA's done for me. <laughs> and um, uh, You were also very hurt by a, a trip that your schoolmates took that you were supposed to go on. Oh, around, yeah. Just around that age, it would yeah, be. Yeah, I was, I was, I was uh, unceremoniously kind of um, told, uh, well, we were going to go away with you, but we're not now. That's really shitty. Yeah, but uh, as I write in the book, that actually what happened was, um, you know, I, 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 what I don't say in the book, I don't say that I was lovely no. in the book. I mean, I may well have deserved that. I don't know. I think I, think, I, think I probably didn't, actually, in, mm. in thinking about it, but... But um, what actually happened was not going on this interrailing trip um, uh, meant that I uh, went to the National Youth Theatre yeah. and met David Walliams when I was 16. So, so uh, you know, thanks to them, really, mm. is the way I can look at it. Um, but there, so was I, a lot, there was a lot to be angry about two years later when you were... Were you going to go to university? What was the plan? Drama school or um, at I that was, point? Uh, I was going to yeah I was going to un to university and then I took a year out to do stand up comedy and then by the time I went to university I'd already you know Bob Mortimer spotted me after five weeks mm. I was 18 and said I want to you know help you get work I want to do something with you what did you. you think did you trust him Yes. Well, he's, he's, he's an was eminently definitely, trustworthy character. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, but, but yeah, still, yeah. I mean, it is a, it's a remarkable... It's there was nothing in it other than he just liked what I did. Obviously, yeah, 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 yeah. but, yeah. but at in the fact, time... He was an incredibly It's a magic wand moment, isn't it? It was it's a so magic wand moment. He was incredibly supportive. And, and aside from the... the uh, he just happened to be at a gig that I was at. I'd been going for five weeks, and he was in the audience. And I was the biggest Vic and Bob pa fan on the planet. And my heart was beating, you know, knowing he was there. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, uh, and he was incredible. He took me under his wing, basically, and was really supportive and introduced me to powerful people. And I still had to go on stage and make people laugh, you know, when it came to it. And in some ways, expectations would have been higher on me. But the confidence it gave me. You know, to the validation. To, the validation was insane. I mean, it's like being, you know, as I say in the book, it's like being, um, you know, being the biggest Paul McCartney and John Lennon fan, yes. and then becoming their Ringo, quite literally, because <laughs> I was a drummer. But um, it, it it was a fairy tale. It was an absolute fairy tale. But I was living this double life because I was also working in a shop mm. for Chelsea Football Club, and you can see I am an Arsenal fan. But those are some of the funniest bits in it. This yeah. sort of smuggled. Arsenal fan into the and it was a was it a family connection that got you in there? Or, or, or uh, I, well, I was so I kind of grew up uh, very pretty observant uh, uh, Jewish and um, I was a youth leader at the synagogue one of the one of the, you know a madrich as they're called and would help run the youth clubs and and uh, uh, I wasn't the youth leader but mm. I would I would help out it's a kind of voluntary thing to do and. Um, one of the a uh, couple of the kids, their 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 mum and dad said, I, I put an advert in the synagogue magazine, Emmet, um, uh, saying I would like to babysit just to earn some some money, you know, yes. while I was doing my A levels, and um, and Clive Pollard, who uh, owned owned the franchise for the Chelsea shop, um, I would babysit his kids and then. He uh, uh, was telling me that he had this, this, he'd taken over the franchise for the Chelsea shop. And I was looking, I'd said to my mum, I'd like to do stand up comedy in my year off. I'd like to do that. And my mum said, well, that's fine, but you're still going to have to bring some money into the house because, you know, my mum had like two, sometimes three jobs. So, uh, so I said to Clive Pollard, would you hire me at your, for your shop? And he said, well, you, you're a little bit young. And I said, well, you trust me with your kids, so <laughs> you should trust me in your shop. And he went, actually, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and so I was assistant manager of the club shop at Chelsea Football Club, but I was a huge Arsenal fan. And yeah, I would wear my Arsenal top underneath. And, uh, and, and then I would do my stand-up comedy in the evenings. And so I was very tired because I was working long hours in the shop and then traveling all over. And I don't drive, so I'd be getting buses here, trains there, getting lifts here and... and and doing stand-ups, it was a bit of a double life because I'd do this fantastic gig, you know, and everyone would be cheering and then the next morning I'd be, you know, kind of loading these kits. Or I'd do a terrible gig 
and the next morning I'd still be loading the kits, you know. Um, and so, so yeah, it was a strange, strange existence. But then by the time I got to university, my head had already been turned. And I, uh, 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 Avalon, who were a big, huge comedy management company, still are, and they looked after uh, Newman and Badil, yes. and they looked after Frank Skinner and Harry Hill and Leon Herring and Jenny Eclair and big, big comedians. They were talking to me about possibly managing me uh, which I didn't do in the end, but I did gigs that they promoted. Mm. Um, and Big time. Uh, yeah, and David's agent at ICM, which was a huge agency. So you stayed agency. friends with David after U30, you stayed yeah, friends. Yeah, yeah, right? so we'd stayed friends, and, and yeah, because we'd met, and yeah, we just stayed in touch, we were friends, and that's how our relationship was built on friendship, you know. Mm. So, so, uh, so then I had, you know, Addison Cresswell tried to sign me up, who again managed, you know, uh, Jack D and... Uh, well, later Michael McIntyre and, and Lee Evans, and you know, he showed an interest. And so there was a little bit of, you know, that going on. People knew who I was. And, and, and a lot of it was down to Bob Mortimer's incredible support. You know, he just uh, believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. And even when sometimes gigs would go down the pan, he'd say, well, you know, sometimes me and Vic, you know, no one laughs. We went to Canada, they did the Just for Laughs. Uh, uh, they sang Lucky Carpet, which was one of their songs. They said they died a death. They said, it doesn't matter. You know, we do what we do. And I remember Bob saying, it's better to be, you know, one person's favorite comedian than a hundred people's third or fourth favorite. He said, Brilliant. if you're somebody's favorite comedian, then you've made it, you know. And, uh, and he just gave me some quotes for my poster, you know, and things like that. And it was just, it gave me a kind of a little bit of a frisson little bit of authority. And the other person who really was really kind to me, again, when I'd only, only been going about a year or less, was Harry Hill. Mm. I was on the bill with him once or twice, and then he said, uh, you know, are you playing all these other clubs? And I said, well, it's hard to get them to return my call, or, you know, they're very, they're bigger clubs than I can play. And he said, well, I'm gonna give you, you know, eight phone numbers here, and you call them and you tell them that I gave you the number and I recommend you. And so, again, you know, there was a real, there was, it was, it was, it was, you know, there was a lot of kindness as well. And, I received. And, and, and I mean, talent notwithstanding, a bit of luck as well. Absolutely. I mean, I always say to anybody, if anybody says, you know, what do you need to make it? I say, well, <clears throat> if I can, you know, some people would say I've made it, other people would say I wouldn't, but I haven't. But no, if no. I've made it on some level, I would say you need talent. Mm. Um, you need to work really, really, really hard. And you also need luck. And those are the three things. And two of those three won't be enough, you know. Yes. Talent, uh, hard work and luck. Those Chutzpah. three things. Yeah, well, whatever. But like the other night, I was on a plane and um, I'm writing something new at the moment, I'm developing a new TV show. Excellent. And thank you. And, you know, I looked around and, and it was flying through the night and every single person was asleep and I wrote the entire journey. And sometimes it's, it's, um, it's about yeah staying in and writing Doing like, like when I was writing that book I was also doing Doctor Who I wrote on Christmas Day I wrote Boxing Day I mean it's fun, like it's fine you know it's, mm. it's I, I got the best job in the world so this is, this is not me complaining no, I know, but I'm I know, saying I know. you you have to put the hours in you have to put the hours in and yes. even when you're a big deal you have to put the hours in and so, actually that's something as much as anybody I learned that from David who's right. just who's more who's, so than you I mean at the time the, 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 I remember in early interviews the the, the impression given was that he he'd crack the whip a bit with you when you were yes, collaborating together. Yes, I'm sure he together. needed to, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, you know, because I was doing stand-up, so I'd be like, mm, maybe we can just start at like two yeah, in the afternoon sure. and we can do, you know, three hours and then I'll go to a gig. And I was like, you know, because comedians on the circuit, you know, they're slogging around the circuit, right? And they might be doing two gigs a night and they're rushing around and all that. So they have this kind of adrenaline thing. But actually, the comedians on the circuit that I worked with, the, the culture was, you know, if you had a set that was 20 minutes and it worked, that's your set, yeah. that's what you did. People weren't, there was no YouTube, nobody's filming you and putting you up. You know, and you could do it again and again and again and again. You yeah. could do it again and again. There was a thing that if you did a few minutes on television, you might need to replace it. But then sometimes you do three minutes on television and then cut them from your set and then people who'd seen the TV show would go, oh, I missed, you should yeah. have done that yeah, joke. Yeah, yeah. Um, but generally you would be in the, in the dressing room at the comedy store, which I played a few times, not many times, because my act was a bit too strange, but I played it a few <laughs> times and, um, and somebody would walk in and they'd go, um, I'm doing a new joke tonight. 
and we'd all kind of gather around and go, oh, what's the joke? And then they'd tell you the joke and people would kind of discuss it and somebody say, oh, maybe you could change that and do this. And then we'd all listen in to see how the new joke went and it yes. would be a big deal. Yes. But when I started working with David and I stopped doing the stand-up circuit because I realised it was just too much to do both and actually I found it more enriching and fulfilling the kind of work I was doing with David. Plus, because George Dawes had got big, it was hard, it just gigs became just tougher to do because mm. uh, of different expectations from the audience. David and I would, would start at 10 and we'd go till 4.35. And actually, you know, he was quite strict and we'd chat for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day, but it's like, now we need to get to work. And and then, but we'd write, you know, 15, 20 minutes a week or more yes. of, of usable stuff. And then I thought, oh my God, so this whole thing about adding in a new joke every month, this is, this is, there's a different way of doing this. Yes. You can be much more prolific and much more inventive. Um, and They're you can completely quickly. different mediums, aren't they? Really? They are different mediums. I was amazed when I first started going to comedy clubs, probably around about this time, and it was it was the comedy store in Leicester Square. I was amazed when I went back two weeks later and saw the same act doing the same. That's right, yeah. I couldn't actually quite believe it. Yeah, but I will say in fairness, promoters would... Yeah, and I'd see, I'd see, you know, because I, I used to go and watch comedy all the time yeah. before I was doing you it. You used to go to Edinburgh on your own, didn't you? You'd go it? to Edinburgh Festival, yeah, and all of that. And I'd just go in London and watch gigs all the time and really yes. immerse myself in it. And I'd go, oh, I've already seen her because I knew that yeah. I knew what I was going to get. But there were some people, and I will say Mark Thomas, who was oh. like the king of the circuit yeah. and is still one of the greatest. For sure. One of the greatest comics we've got. Um, he he was a marvel, and you'd see him on a Monday, and then you'd see him on a Thursday, new set, right? And funny, yeah, and topical, um, and insightful, and and just kind of brilliant. I wonder if know? it's because he's so politically engaged. He's, yeah. quite, he's constantly thinking and he changing. He was constantly thinking, and 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 he had interesting things to say that transcended just jokes. Yes. but they were still funny ideas. They were funny. He was he was brilliant. And, and there were a few people that were a bit more prolific, but it was more just the culture of the circuit. You were, I remember playing Jonglers, and it went down all right. Which, and Jonglers was the big chain. Um, and I didn't really enjoy it, so I only did it once, and they said, oh, you should come back. And, but actually, I just didn't, I didn't really enjoy it. It felt very corporate, and mm. I just thought, I think I could do this, but I think the reality is that it's always going to, you know, I'm always going to have to, to work really hard in this room. Right. This is never going to be an audience that's what that wants to hear what I'm doing. You, you get a lot of stag Yeah, nights, and I it. thought, yeah, because it's an interesting thing. Of Sometimes you play gigs that were free. Right. Um, you'd still get paid, but the gigs were free, like student gigs, universities, they'd be sponsored. Somebody would be picking up the check, you know, uh, uh, Newcastle Brown Ale or something like that. But actually what happens is when an audience doesn't pay anything, they don't have any investment in the evening. And those gigs are actually quite hard mm. to do as a comedian because mm. you'd think, oh, they'll be grateful that they didn't have to pay, but actually they might just sit and talk. It's the opposite. And, and similarly, when an audience pays too much, there's a, they, they might also feel that they don't actually have to listen. They've almost paid for the right to do what they want in that room. And that often happens for comedians when they're doing Christmas parties around this time of year. That becomes, they, they're quite tough gigs also because a lot of alcohol is involved mm. and you charge a lot for Christmas parties and it's a kind of, um, you know. Yeah, uh, the power balance is different. Yeah, from, it's from... different. And so, and that was one of the things that Jonglers, which was, it was quite a corporate audience. It was a lot of kind of office parties and they paid uh, they paid uh, quite a lot of money to go, yes. and you got paid a bit more money to do the gigs. You know, it was a, it was a great but gig. A trade off. Yeah, but I just thought my kind of act is I could go there and I could storm, or I could go there and I could die, or I could, I could or I could change my act mm. and do a different set that's my jongler's set. But I just thought actually, other people will flourish more in this environment, and and I and I and I can gig in other places. Sure. But the thing I remember them saying to me is, uh, don't change your set. It worked. Right. So they just wanted me to just do more gigs. Like a with production that. line, like, like a kind of. Yeah, uh, I'm not being critical of them. I mean, they knew what worked for them. It's a business model. Yeah, it's a business model. Not a creative look, equation. Yes and no. Look, I, I'm not singling them out because ultimately, in, in these venues where you're playing, you're there so that they can sell food and drink. Of I mean, that you're. is why you're there. You're. So you just, can't start getting too full of yourself. No. Um, let's back up a little bit because George Dawes, 21 years old, um, you were, and then. The, the the next big thing was Little Britain. Yeah. So that collaboration with David, how did that come about? How did that how did the friendship segue into collaboration and, and the, the, the the kind of all the complications of being a double act that that can sometimes <laughs> entail? Well, we we met in the National Youth Theatre and What parts were you playing? Uh he well, I was doing a course 
because when you go in, you do a kind the of induction course. The very first year you do a course. Yes. Do you so know, I, just, I, just, I, just, I, did, I interviewed Krishna Guru Murthy last week. Were you there at the same time? I don't remember Because I did my Manchester Youth Theatre, which oh, for you? me was the most seminal summer of my life. It changed everything. And for me, the MIT. Like, well, probably for similar reasons, background being completely challenged, because I was at an all-boys monastic boarding school, and suddenly I'm in the middle of Manchester middle of Manchester we're in a, a hall of residence full of girls but um but I, I didn't realize that he'd he'd done it oddly I, and the, the course is what you do the first time because I was supposed to go and do the course in London I wonder if we'd have been in the same oh, intake might have been. and I didn't because the fellow who ran Manchester Youth Theatre said if you come to Manchester I'll give you a cracking part in our play so don't go to London so, so what I, did you do I went I went to Manchester and got a decent part in the play and went back three, the three years running it was famous the spur oh, um, right. based on a on a Howard something novel I played at Alderman Hawley Arting Stall did you have a great but, time but, mate the time of my life there and, you and, go. and and because you, you were at a public school but not a boarding school is that right yeah that's Habit that's right. ask is, is it's one of the chapters but the, yeah. for me to the, the the horizon broadening experience of that kind of thing which young people today don't have access to in quite the same way was was absolutely unparalleled so i understand how you and david could have forged a friendship there that felt definitely definitely different and special yeah and we we kind of bonded because we both grew up within touching distance of the centre of London, but not quite being. You yeah, know, he was okay. in Banstead. Yeah, it's, me- it's, it's metro land, isn't it, in a way? Yeah, and I was at the very top of the Jubilee line, and he'd been to a grammar school, I'd been to Haberdashers, but I was on a free place. Yes. You know, so I'd, I'd hear everyone at Habs talking about their skiing trips and their and their holidays to Florida and everything, and we, I never had that. My you know. dad, when I started at private school, my dad paid my fees, but it was a struggle, I now realise. We'd been to Morecambe for our holiday right, right. In, in Lancashire and all these kids have been to Barbados or Kitzbühel so dad told me he said pronounce it Morikambi oh really <laughs> there you make go. it sound really exotic there you go <laughs> so that was it where did you want it Morikambi well my, uh, there, I had the joke of I went to Romania <laughs> oh really well no I, I went I went to remain here um, but uh, so you were, you were an outsider and an insider you know, or an outsider actually both of you felt like outsiders who we both just found felt a little other. bit yeah I think at his school he'd been sort of singled out because he was considered I mean then you would say effeminate it's yes. not a word I use too much like effeminine or or he was just you know he was David Williams <laughs> yes, yes sort of basically an adjective. <laughs> yeah and um and I was just yeah and I didn't I, I had friends sure. I had friends at school but I and I know David had friends at his school um but we were both just searching for something and and I think we both knew that we weren't going to be you know, people from my school became doctors and mm. lawyers, and it, 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 you know, and went to to Oxford or Cambridge often, and that was the the thing. And uh, and I think David knew that that probably wasn't for him either. And we met at the National Youth Theatre, and I kind of idolised him. I mean, he was kind of taller, older, um, funnier, and I'd watch him f- from the wings. We the next year we did, did a play fancy? together. No, not at all. Just check, no, just I never. No, I just never did. I never did. Uh, no. Which is probably good. Right, of course it is. If I had fancied him, it might have been a bit icky and weird. Mm. And But no, there was never... I think people used to think we were a couple. Yes. But there was never... I never felt that towards him. I admired him. I respected him. I thought he was brilliant. I kind of did everything other than fancy him. Um, uh, so the friendship stayed in place while you were off pursuing the stand-up which led into shooting stuff. Yeah, and he and was then... doing children's television. He was writing for Anton Deck or PJ and Duncan as they were that. then. Yeah, and he um, was doing kids' TV um, and stuff like that. And and But we were just friends and, and we would just see a lot of each other. We'd go to the cinema and the theatre. And also he had a girlfriend, but there was something queer about him, you know? And I use that in a slightly more in in the contemporary use of that word, not the not the derogatory use yes. of that word, you know, in a kind of a kind of a shameless, unapologetic otherness about him. Mm. And he would wear men's skirts and he would uh, paint his fingernails black and he'd put a hair clip in his hair and I'd go out with him and his girlfriend. And so and people would and he'd sit on the tube and I'd uh, uh people wouldn't know what to think and when we first did that my heart would sink like what are you what do you look like but then actually after a (laughs) while I thought this is glorious you know I've got this funny friend and he doesn't care what people think and so there was a big influence that'd be a particularly big deal to you yeah well he liberated me he liberated me you know uh, and and uh, we didn't talk a great deal about my uh being gay 
Um, but he would just like introduce me to his friends and go, this is Matt, he's gay. <laughs> like that to kind of, and it was just funny. Like I was just like shocked at first. And then I was just like, um, you know, that was just a funny thing to do. And I remember when I finally came out to my mother in my mid twenties, um, I called David up afterwards to say, oh, just so you know, this kind of big thing, you know, we were just working every day by then. Mm. This, this kind of big thing just happened, which is I actually just told my mum that I'm gay. And, uh, and he said, how did it go? And I said, you know, and I explained, as I talk about in the book, that mm. my mum was very upset and shocked and, and uh, you did, she was not expecting to hear this. And, you know, and now she's fine about it, but it just took her time and it had taken my brother time. And I was just telling him, we had this great chat for about an hour. And then, you know, and I thanked him for his support and everything. And then there was a beat and then the phone rang and I picked it up, I went, hello. And he goes, you never told me you were gay. <laughs> <laughs> I just put the phone down and laughed. You know, so he was just brilliant at, at that. You and know. you knew there was, a, there was a chemistry here that was oh, a bit yeah, special. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, like the yeah, best yeah. kind of friendships, but obviously Yeah, this... there, it was heady, you know, it was like, there was, there was, it, there was, it was daring when we were on stage together. It was just well, like- we're, jump, we're jumping ahead a bit. Yeah, Because yeah. you're still not sure. At what point did, did one of you say, why don't we see what we can do together? So, so I'd been doing the circuit for a while and in 1995, when I was 21, I'd filmed shoot, no, 1994 actually, before mm. Shooting Stars and before I'd worked with Vic and Bob, uh, actually, but I'd already met them, but I hadn't worked with them yet. Uh, I went to the Edinburgh Festival with a friend of mine called Dorian Crook, who's the guy that was comparing the gig when Bob Mortimer came because Dorian Crook was at art school with Vic or right. Jim as he's called. Yes. And he was part of the Vic Reeves Big Night Out gang and he would be in Vic Reeves Big Night Out and he toured with them um, in the stage show. And Dorian uh, and I became friends and we're still, we're still good friends. And he uh, was going to Edinburgh to do a show and it's, you get like an hour or 55 minutes at the Edinburgh Festival. And he said, look, we could do, why don't I do like 40 minutes and you could come on in the middle and do 10 or 15 and I went great um, and uh, David came up to see the show and we were in the Pleasance Bar and uh, it was almost like we had the same thought at the same moment we turned and said we should should we do a show next year do you want to come up here next year and do something it was like yeah great you know and I can't even remember which one of us asked the other because it, we nice. both had the same thought and then we did a show the next year and it was a really raucous crazy show that was on at midnight uh, in a small room at the assembly rooms and we advertised free crash on the poster because it made us laugh and actually a woman did come with a baby <laughs> we felt really bad about right. it and the first, after like three nights not many people were coming along and I'd heard this trick that this other comic Boothby Graffo had done which I nicked which is I basically put a sign on the door saying sold out right even though we weren't on that night and I did it for a couple of nights I put a sign up saying sold out even though we weren't and then we sold out for pretty much the rest of the run. Oh, funny. Um, but we also sold out. What was out. that act like? What were you doing on stage? It what was, was it, you, you, I don't even think you could do it today. It was, I played Sir Bernard, this actor, mm. and it was his show, and he was gonna talk about his career, and David played this stage manager who had escaped from prison called Tony Rogers, who would terrorize, we would terrorize the audience. We would scream at them, shout at them, move them around, make them swap seats. And we just created, what we did was, we created our environment. So when you walked into that room, you were in our room. We were okay. not in your room. You were in well, would, our room. Would it be silly to ask who your influences were? Uh, Vic and Bob. Right. So Vic and Bob definitely were blend huge of surrealism and yeah, but we were we were less surreal than Vic and Bob. Right. I think we were we uh, there was a uh, more anger and more aggression in what we were doing. But it was more, your world. But it was our world, and it was something that I'd really noticed from from Vic. You know, Jim was was the idea that you had to go to the Goldsmiths Tavern or the Al Albany Empire when they were on their way up, you had to go and see them. Right. They just didn't do right. the circuit. Yeah. And I was still doing the circuit at that time, but generally it was like, no, you have to come to us. A destination. Yeah, and I think we also used to do this thing, which was that we'd often play these, you know, we were doing warm-ups in, in different theatres before Edinburgh, and we'd play these slightly sort of drab not drab no humble humble venues all right let's be honest and <laughs> and you'd arrive and and you'd often you know you'd have a giant bit of set from something else or there'd be a little bit of rubbish and you'd have to clear it up yourself and i and me and david were like well why don't we 
keep the rubbish so we used to keep whatever rubbish was in the venue and then we'd add to it so when you walked into the theater for our show you would find cigarette butts on your seat <laughs> and flyers on the floor even a little bit on the stage in the corner mm. it looked a bit neglected like someone hadn't quite cleared it up and if we had tapes playing that there was the needle you'd hear the needle jump on the tape a little bit it was just a sense of neglect yes. of just sort of like oh nobody's really bothered with these people and we just really, we just kind of enjoyed creating that environment. And we were mad. We, yeah. It was mad. The shows were really anarchic. They were loud. They were aggressive. Because we were in this little room where the show started at midnight. So the room was really hot because of all the other shows yes. that had been there that day. And it was the summer. And people had already seen four or five or six shows of that day. They were already drunk. And, and it was a small room with 100 seats. And the, the seats were on three sides. And if you needed to go to the toilet during the show, you had to walk across the stage to get to the toilet. And, um, and people and we would, needed to. Midnight, and people needed to. Yeah. And we would terrorize them. <laughs> and we would, we would sometimes stand and go, no, you can't. You can go into that cup. And we do. Like, we were just, we were mad. It was crazy. Um, You've you've been at your most animated talking about that. It may just be that yeah. you've maybe that you've settled into the environment. Yeah, as, well, as just we remembering it, just last... remembering it and enjoying it, and and there's a sense of freedom, which I like. Like I said, I said yeah. at the beginning of the interview, you, did. you don't have you don't have that once you're at a certain level, mm. you don't have those freedoms anymore because everything you do is scrutinised. Everything you do is scrutinised. If I go to the theatre, somebody's prob or cinema people are secretly sure. filming you and you realize that if you say one thing that could be you know is negative that it's up on youtube it's on yeah. it's on the the the, the website so this, so was a, this was a period it of was just a different time liberty. it was a period of of yeah of, and of, did you know yeah. you were good don't be don't be unduly modest did you know uh, did you know you were onto something both as a double act and as a we knew we were good at what we were doing right so i don't think we thought oh yeah we're we're the topical comedians i don't think we thought we could do all these other things but yeah we had a confidence and an assurance um You're both still very young to have that level yeah of, i was 21 Vic he was and bob 24. Were much older when they broke through weren't they he, yeah. he'd already been a solicitor for a while bob I think. Yeah, bob yeah he was going to become a barrister he That's was close right. he was yeah. very close to it um uh i was 21 and david was 24 yeah yeah, yeah. but i but i you just um, know when you know you know look it was also i think we both also felt you know, we felt entitled to be good at it because we didn't feel that we were good at anything else. Oh, you know, oh. so it was like, no, this is what we do. Yeah. But also, the truth is that people would come and they'd laugh uproariously, and they would come again and come again and come again. Which is amazing. So, if you think you're good when that happens, you're not completely deluding yourself. No, clearly. You know, not. and I, sometimes I'd read reviews of us or of other acts, and the reviewer would slate slate the show and I'd think well you know you didn't enjoy it but uh, but did the audience laugh and I, mm. I'd read reviews of, of our shows and, and sometimes they were good and sometimes they were bad because pardon me what we did was very polarizing um, and you could definitely take exception to it sure um, or just not get it or not get it or not enjoy it mm. like like that's a completely viable response yeah. and we understood that but it what the only thing that used to bug me is if, if they wrote review slamming the show and didn't acknowledge the fact that it was sold out and that the audience laughed their heads off yeah. and some reviewers did accept didn't acknowledge that and some didn't and that used to i always thought well you you should say that you know yeah, you should I say agree. that um uh, full disclosure yeah i think so but um so that from there then you you realized such the show was a was a success a big success and the next step is to start creating more characters because there's only so far that you and the stage manager could go. Um, is that right or not? Yeah, well, no, actually what happened was that we, off the back of that first Edinburgh show, we got offered a TV series mm. by Paramount Channel, which is now Comedy Central. Yes. Um, what was that like at 21? Because, I mean... It, yeah, well, I, and, I, and, and, I'd, and I'd already shot Shooting Stars before we'd done that show, but it hadn't been out yet, and I was supporting Blur on tour and I was doing the Country House video. It was amazing. Uh, I was still living at home, yes. you know, out in Stanmore. I didn't, you know. How, how did you keep your sexuality secret from your mum during well, that period of your life? If, if that's the correct way to phrase it. Yeah. Uh, well, well it, it, it would be secret if I was off dating people and going to clubs, but I wasn't doing either of those things. So I wasn't, I wasn't having experiences at that right. age. So it's easier to keep it secret when you're not. So you were um, celibate, effectively. Yeah. But uh, also gay. I'd had experiences uh, in my teens, mm. which I write about in the book. You do. But from my late teens until my mid-twenties, I didn't really... And it wasn't just the gay thing. I think I just... 
didn't really have any concept of myself as somebody that people would be attracted to. I thought, well, objectively, you are short, pale, overweight, you have no hair, so nobody's going to be interested in you. Uh, so you just have to just accept that and, 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 and achieve other things, you know, and I just, that's how I thought. And it wasn't until later on when I kind of went to counselling that somebody said, I think you see yourself very differently to how some other people would see you. And of course, now young people would have the internet. And on the internet, not only will uh, young gay people able to talk to each other or through apps or everything, but you can also see that, oh, there are kind of tribes and there's, yes. there's like twinks and muscly guys and bears. <laughs> Something and for everyone. Yeah, exactly. But I didn't really have a concept that I thought that everything I had that, was, that wasn't, uh, you know, quotes ideal was was a negative right whereas now weirdly i get more attention from guys when i'm in a larger when i'm larger than yeah. when i lose weight yeah so so i'm like ah oh, okay that's weird yes. i mean that, that's not an incentive to eat more because i just think <laughs> i i should just be more healthy anyway but i'm just saying it's, it's interesting that that uh that there's someone for everyone, yeah. yeah. And I didn't, I didn't have any real concept of that. And I was just doing stand up and just throwing myself into my work. And then in my mid twenties, I just reached this point where life had just changed. My my father had died very suddenly when I was 22, and I loved him very much. And he just he was your hero, you say? Yeah, but, yeah. And he just died. Uh, uh, had a heart attack, massive heart attack, and died. Out of nowhere. And uh, how old was he? He'd at been the time? ill. He'd been ill for a couple of weeks, for for a couple of months, but we did not expect this. Uh, he was 52. Very, very young. Yeah, and and then I was dealing with fame yes. at that same time, and I was dealing with sexuality, fame, and bereavement, those three things. So I went to a, see a therapist, and then he kind of, we talked about all of these things, and he's like, maybe you should, you know, you could tell your, your mum, you don't have to tell your mum, but you could. And, and I thought, I need to tell my mum before I start going to clubs, because I knew that, he, that it, word would get back. Yes just because I knew that word would. So I so I told my brother and then I told my mother and it took them time to come to terms with it, but they did. Yes, of course. You know, and, of course. and it was different then. You know, there was a sense when I came out in, in 1999, if you were telling someone you were gay, it was because maybe you were HIV positive and you needed to tell them. God, yeah. That was the, the kind of, and if you were HIV positive then. It was a death sentence. Yeah. So, but I wasn't, no. and I'm not. Sure. Uh, and but but it was like it was almost like people didn't really understand that being gay was sort of I think an identity rather than just a behaviour. Mm. And not everybody agrees with me on no. that, which is fair enough. But I think uh, you know there's a difference between ho being homosexual and being gay. Yes, I I do think there's a difference. That's what you meant when you called David queer. Yeah, yeah. queer is is like kind of an identity, yes. you know, um, of kind of treading the line yes. and testing people and being provocative and being maybe indistinct in terms of what his sexuality was to people. Let people guess, let people not be sure, give a sense of one thing, maybe be another thing, not commit, explore, all of those things mm. that, that, you know, that would sum up who he was, where he was at that time in his life, you know, whatever he was whatever whatever he was looking for. So what was the, the, the Paramount Channel show? So about? the Paramount Channel show was called uh, Mash and Peas. We were, we were a double act called Mash and Peas. And the concept was that, um, it actually came from a line that David improvised. We were a bad double act. <laughs> and he improvised this line, which was, we were doing a thing about, we were scolding the, the viewers for writing letters of complaint about us. Can, can you not? Can you not write letters of complaint, please? Like that, because it's like, it's, you don't know what you're talking about, number one. Uh, we were like these entitled middle-class comedians who would just get really shirty with the viewers. Can you not, can you not do that, please? Because like, and, uh, and then David just improvised this line at the end. He goes, yeah, and stop writing in because my dad owns this channel and this is my friend. Like that. And then we just thought, I just thought, yeah, that's brilliant. That's why we're on, because we're the children of the owner of the channel. That's a great idea. That's why we're being indulged. You're so more the about idea... making each other laugh. A yeah, lot of, of the course, time, of course. It? And so the idea was that uh, um, the idea that was yeah that we were kind of shit, but you were stuck with us, and we just kind of enjoyed that, you know, and uh, and a bit like we were different characters to Sir Bernard sure. and Tony that he'd played. But again, it was just the idea that you were. I'm sorry, you're stuck. You're not. You, you're not seeing the best people. That just just used to, which is a little bit Victory's Big Night Out, yes. isn't it? The kind yes, of ramshackle nature mm. of it. Mm. Um, and it is genuinely ramshackle because sometimes the, the 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 chaos on a stage is actually painstakingly plotted and mm. choreographed. But but you 
and David and and Vic and Bob aren't. There, there is. I mean, obviously, there's a there's a strong foundation. You both know exactly what you're doing, but there is a anything could happen next type feel to both. That was the, that was the vibe. And although by the time we did Little Britain. We actually wanted everything to look as good as it possibly could look. Yes. And to be as... And that, but I still think, subverting the genre while trying yeah. to be as true to the genre as possible. So the slicker and the neater it looked, perhaps the more effective the subversion becomes. Well, you still had Tom Baker saying something crazy, yes. you know, to kind of undermine you. And, yeah, I think so, yeah. I think so. But also, I think the League of Gentlemen were a big influence on us. And the Fast Show had shown us, you know, that sketch shows could have a concept because I'd been right. very resistant to the idea of doing a sketch show because I just thought oh, I don't want to do the Matt and Dave show I you see know, like, yeah which is why just... the characters were so out there then because it, it wasn't a sketch show in any conventional sense no and I think but I think also The League of Gentlemen was directed by Steve Benderlack who did the first series of Little Britain yes. and he brought a kind of cinematic yes uh, quality to it and a uh, real sense of style and panache and it changed your life a Little Britain changed our lives yeah yeah and I like to think the lives of people who it. <laughs> Many people at home. Um, to start with, entirely in a good way. Well, I mean, it was just bizarre, you know, because it's just, it's, it, we just thought, we, it's amazing, we've been working together eight years and we finally have a show on proper telly because we'd had uh, the Paramount mm. show and we'd also had this series called Rock Profile and we have been yeah. getting this kind of cult following and people still remembered me from Shooting Stars. So we were just kind of on that level and I thought... And we'll get a series that'll be on BBC Two and maybe we'll get a second series and that'll be our show and then we'll go and do something else or we'll do something maybe not together or mm. we'll do because we didn't only work together. We were just like what well, we're doing we did stuff together but we also did stuff apart. He was doing this show called Attachments, this kind of drama, like a mm. kind of uh, an attempt to recreate this life type show on BBC Two and so he you know, he had a bit of a reputation as an actor. You know, I was still could do a bit of stand up and and um, did it go mad straight away? Was it? From, no, 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 but quickly. Yeah, I remember it was still on BBC Three, which not everyone knew they could get, or they couldn't all get it, or people weren't in the habit of watching it. And like Richard Littlejohn started referring to it in his column, uh, Vicky Pollard, and then, uh, and then I think it was in the Sun or the Mail, they did a cartoon of Tony Blair, I think, going no, but yeah, but no, but yeah, but. Or something like that, and, and and I think the first series was still on, and then really the moment where we knew it had gone insane was when the first episode premiered on BBC Three and got 1.8 million viewers, which was more than what BBC Two got that mm. night, and nothing on BBC Three had ever. I think I think maybe the BBC Three had shown EastEnders before it was on but that was the BBC only, One. Yes. I don't think it all on the or the launch, but not, no, it was like it was many, many, many times more viewers than most shows would get on that channel. And then and then I was really, like, then I think we knew, yes. oh, okay, okay. But, but good, I mean, excited. Yeah, I mean, amazing, amazing. To yeah. bring... It was kind of always good. I don't, I don't, I mean, there were always, there was some strange moments in it. And, you know, and like I say, suddenly you come under the scrutiny of Well, that's of all I'm press. referring to. I'm not yeah, suggesting... Yeah, but I mean, that, no. that did not ruin the experience. No, of, of course, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting I'm not it did, like, but the fame... I don't have this agenda against the press. I don't... Well, I, know I, I, I know you I, don't. I, uh, uh, you know, there's loads of brilliant journalism. I read the papers. I, I don't... I'm not, I'm not down on the press. I'm just... I just, some ha habits and tactics well, just, that they employ are a bit rank, and that's. I mean, uh, I, I agree, and I, I, I used to do it for a living. Yeah, um, but not all of them. No, I don't, absolutely you know, not. not all, no, not, I know. Not, I not all of them. Absolutely, you know. I get yeah, that. Yeah. I really do. Um, so that was hugely successful. You've spoken, you've written about why some elements of it you probably wouldn't do again now. Some of the gender stuff, some of the. Yeah, I just think we're in a very different time, and uh, you know, we, you know, sometimes some people, some younger viewers. Uh, sometimes contact me on Twitter and things like that and say, you know, you need to apologise or you need to explain oh, really? what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a thing that happens. And, and you know, I do, I'm happy to engage with people who feel like that. So even Daffid, I mean, that, that... Yeah, and I think the thing is, you know, that show, you wouldn't make that show now no. in that way. And I, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, you know, you'd have to ask David and get his his opinion on it. Um, he, I can't tell you if he does or doesn't feel no. the same way. But I, 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 I wouldn't do what we did then, but uh, in the same way. But the show wasn't made in a vacuum. Uh, uh, the, it was made at the BBC, which is a 
we all know is has traditionally less so now but has traditionally been more left wing mm. um just by the very ethos of it being publicly funded uh, state funded um and at the time the bbc did not have an issue with a rubbish transvestite the bbc did not have an issue at the time with us playing other races they did not have an issue at the time with Marjorie Dawes making jokes about overweight people. They mm. did not have an issue at the time with all of these contentious things. Very occasionally... It never felt like bullying, though. It never well, felt... Well, I don't think it did. No. Some people okay. would, would see it other, other ways. But, um, but right now, if you were doing a sketch show, it would not feel appropriate to make light of uh, no. a transgender character. Um, in my mind... Uh, uh, the rubbish transvestite was a transvestite and not somebody who was uh, sure. identifying as a, as a woman or undergoing surgery or, or you know, but I still acknowledge that it comes, you know, it's under the same umbrella yes. of of questioning, I guess, mm. and or, 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 or feeling other to how you may biologically be. Um, and, you know, again, I'd love to do Marjorie Dawes again. I think about it. I've got some ideas. I'm 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 split over whether it would be too contentious to do it right now, or whether you could do it do it differently, or whether you could do the same. I don't know. Um, playing other races uh, is not something I'd propose at this time. You know, the con the the concept of Little Britain was that we played everyone. Yes. So you know, forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but kind of tall, short, fat, thin. You know, yes. black, white, straight, gay, male, female. So, so we ne we never felt like, isn't it funny that I'm playing a woman? You know, Marjorie Dawes, uh, the Fat Fighters lady. I don't think Marjorie Dawes is funnier because a man is playing her. I don't mm. think there's any comedy in that. I think if if Dawn French was playing her, it would probably be a funnier character. But it just happens to be me because it's in Little Britain because we wrote it. Mm. So I don't think. I, you know, and it's the same when I see the League of Gentlemen. You know, I don't think it's funnier because men are playing it. It's they're just really talented performers and, and they do great jobs. Um, and similarly, I don't think when I see Come Fly with Me and I'm playing Taj, you know, uh, uh, who's the the you know uh, um, of Pakistani origin, but he's the uh, you know he works in the in the airport. I don't believe that there's any significant any extra you know, uh, a comedy no, coming from the fact that it's a Caucasian performer playing an Indian role. I don't see that, yes. you know, and that's not our intention. I can, I'm, I'll say that, same with Precious. But at the same time, there are other issues that come into play where aside from, aside from whether you argue one way or the other about, about the, the rights and wrongs and offense of one person from one race playing a character from another race, I think there is a greater appreciation of the fact, and there was some appreciation at the time, but a much greater appreciation of the fact that uh, this is a job that you are denying yes. a person of colour. Which probably doesn't apply to Little Britain, but does apply well, to so much of the rest of the industry does, that you, you fall into yeah, that Yeah, and interestingly, category. like the, the situation with Geoffrey Tambor at the moment yes. is, is that uh, you know he has left um, that show transparent for... And not like, I don't know, I wasn't there, but what appears to be inappropriate behaviour. But there is also a sense that even in the four or five years since that show began, mm. the idea of casting a non-trans performer in that role feels antiquated now yeah. Yeah. to how it felt then. So it's progress. Yeah, so, so I think it's general progress. So when people say to me, oh, you can't do Little Britain now, it must really <laughs> annoy you. It actually doesn't because I think, it, I think the changes that are happening for the right reasons, I think we are currently in the middle of a big time of change. Yes. And I think things will settle. And I think people, at the moment, some people look at Little Britain and, and, and sort of damn it. But I think people may have a more, have a different view of it again in years to come where well, they and, accept and that it's something of its time yes. and in, in not not every single person of one race who played a person of another race during that period had malevolent intent you or, know? Or, or and I know I know that we didn't have ill intent sure. I mean even if you even if you don't like it I know that you know even if you felt offended by it I know that there was no intention to give offense only to provide entertainment actually so that's why I, that's how i'm how i can live with it but at this time it would be because even if even if i personally am not offended by one person playing a different race 
right? If I saw a black performer playing another race, even mm. whether I am or not offended personally, I'm aware of the offence it gives. Yes. And I'm aware of the noise it makes yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And what I don't massively want to be is a kind of poster boy for, I mean, you want to be on the right side of history. And I don't <laughs> want to be a poster boy for, you know, yes, I for, do. for, Nothing Nef- nefarious. But, yeah, yeah, you know, it's not. We only want to entertain. You yes. know, and and that's reflected in I think well, the work it, we've done we're, subsequently. We're going to run out of time, but sorry, no, it's, it's it's brilliant. I could listen to you all day. I really could actually, and that's probably the best recommendation I can make for people. Thank you. And to likewise, buy the book, to buy I feel bad me. because last time we met, we it, 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 we spoke more. You spoke more, and now yeah, I'm just, just rabbiting we away. Do, we do it the other way around next year. Yeah. Um, when it ended, when Little Britain ended, it, yeah. it occurs to me that must have been a bit like coming up from deep sea diving and suddenly. Well, we went on to, uh, we did it in America, we did it on tour. So actually, we, I know it went we on were, for a long time. We were ready for the we were ready for the end of it. Were you? You'd, yeah, you'd, we were ready for the end of it. As and far we, as you could. We, yeah, definitely. And actually, we were in talks with the BBC about doing more. Um, but Jay Hunt, who was then in charge of the BBC, said, "Look, why don't you do something else?" You know, mm. and she was right. You know, and uh, so we did come fly with me, yeah. and that was really good. And as I write in the book, you know, things happened in my life that changed yes. you know my situation and so uh we just did one series the yeah. bbc wanted a second series we didn't do one um and then i and i moved to a different country to begin a new life yes uh, and david kind of began a new career as well didn't yeah he? and actually is and, uh, more successful than the two of us ever were i think as I a writer know about that. but he's huge and he deserves it he works hard i think his I'm books not, are fantastic i'm not trying i'm not going to try no and but i'm still going to yeah. i'm still going to pay tribute because Quite right because why You're proud wouldn't of him. i i'm pr- pleased for him proud of him uh what's you know ne- i know like i say i remember him writing on the plane on yeah, the way yeah. back writing the first book you know uh, i am currently in the midst of creating a new TV series that I'm really excited about, really excited about. It's not like anything else I've ever written. Um, And uh, I'm talking to a broadcaster about it and I'm talking to a very notable collaborator, um, a very celebrated- You're so coy. Somebody who I would, well, no contracts have been signed. (laughs) It's not been green lit. Um, But uh, if all goes well, fingers crossed, you'll hear about it soon. Brilliant. And- um, Are you still ambitious, man? uh, Yes. My main ambition is to write a stage musical. That's what I want to do more than anything, including the the story, the the music and the lyrics. I love writing music. And actually, if you buy this book, there's a song in the middle of the book. This is true. Which you can can go to middleofthebook.com and hear the song, whether you buy the book or not. (laughs) The sheet music's in there. Or if you buy the audio book, it just plays the song. Um, I love, yeah, I want to do some, some music, yeah. Sorry about that. No, I think it's lovely. There's nothing worse than when a comedian says, brings out a guitar. He's <laughs> like, oh no, I'm sorry. Alexander Armstrong's onto his second album now. He's got a great voice though, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah. I used to hear him. When we did, when we did um, uh, those shows in Edinburgh, yeah. he was in that double act with Ben Miller. Of course, yeah. And I'd go and um, they did these, they played these two old kind of American, kind of, kind of like a Bing Crosby, Bob Hope kind of guys wisecracking double act and they did a song called fuck knows what i do without you and they would sing it and it was great and you could hear that you could hear it even then they had the, they had oh the yeah stones. yeah he had a proper set of lungs on him and jason manford is the other person is with he a really cracking you haven't you haven't checked out nick Knowles's new album then the not yet DIY how is he how, i don't know I, I just noticed it was out there for the christmas yeah, but market good good you know it's it's a very it's it's not a british thing to go i know i did that <laughs> but now i'm doing this yeah you're right but good luck to anyone who does it you know in america they're much more like well, they've, great. they've got a phrase for it haven't they when they What's start that? Talk about staying in your lane no we right, say okay. pigeonholing but they say i'm not going to stay in my lane yeah, Why yeah, should yeah. I stay in my lane? Why yeah. not do something different? Exactly. You look at the great entrepreneurs, people who come through hip hop and yeah. then have their clothing labels or their smart water or everything. And I say good luck to people. Like, like why not? You know, explore explore other things. Oh, we look and forward so, to it. Thank we you very much. I can't wait for that. Thank, I'm not bringing out water. Don't worry. <laughs> there's already water. There's some in that glass. You don't need me. You've got water. You don't need Matthew water. <laughs> well, I don't know. Don't ever rule any. Never no. say never. I might bring out some cake. <laughs> Branded cake. Yeah. That's been lovely. Thanks Thank you very much. Both. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.